Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes. On today's episode, it's my favorite book in the New Jedi Order series, Jason Solo's Torture and Education While in Captivity. It's Traitor by Matthew Stover. And joining me to talk about the book today is my buddy, Matt. How are you doing today, Matt? Hey, buddy, Aaron. It's always a pleasure to uh, join my voice to yours in chatting about our favorite universe. So, listener, if you've been with us on our adventure through the New Jedi Order, you know that Matt and Scott run the Davos Fingers podcast, a show focusing on the book series, A Song of Ice and Fire. Matt, what is the latest going on at Davos Fingers? Yeah, you know, we consider ourselves still an A Song of Ice and Fire podcast, but we've kind of reached the bottom of the barrel uh, in covering A Song of Ice and Fire content. We're waiting for a new book. We've covered everything else that's out there. So we're currently covering a new series. That's been out for a while. It's new to us, though. The King Killer Chronicle series by Patrick Rothfuss. It's another fantasy-adjacent type series. Uh, we're currently in book one that's called The Name of the Wind. We cover about five to seven chapters per episode in a spoiler-free format. So if you've never read the books before but would like to get into it, it our podcast is a safe place for you. And we'd love to have you along for the ride. Later on today's show, of course, Matt and I are going to talk about the 2023 American League East champion Baltimore Orioles from last night. Now 100 oh, wins. And if you <laughs> cannot tell, I am completely stoked. Insufferably so. Oh. <laughs> In all honesty, listener, coming up at the end of the show, we have a new Star Wars character grouping. And it's great that Matt's here because Matt is the one that kind of kick-started the Star Wars characters way back during my stories about Rogue Squadron and Ray Squadron when he wanted to talk about what your ideal character squadron would be. So, Matt, you only have yourself to blame on these. That's been a fun ride, man. It's been fun to hear all those. So, Before we get there, though, and before we talk about today's book, we need to talk about listener questions. We have two emails today. The first comes from Keenan. Yeah, Keenan says, I discovered your podcast a few months ago. It's a blast. I agree, Keenan. It's quite a feat to bring together Star Wars fans, including your co-hosts, into peaceful discussion with constructive disagreement. I have two questions. I know Darth Bane is a favorite of yours, mine too, but if you had to choose a favorite dark side user or Sith outside of live action or Bane, who would they be? You've also shared that Darth Vader is your favorite character and you aren't a huge fan of Anakin. So after watching The Clone Wars, did you have a new appreciation slash view of Anakin? I feel The Clone Wars made his turn to the dark side have more depth and shows the grief that comes with a dark side turn. Well, thank you very much for the email, Keenan. I guess my favorite dark side user that is not currently in a live action project or is Darth Bane. <laughs> Would have to be Asajj Ventress from the Clone Wars animated show. In all honesty, I don't really relate too much to the dark side users, but I can't deny that many of them are really, really cool. I like Asajj Ventress for the fact that she's double crossed by her own master. She's left wandering. And she has difficulty trying to come to terms with the fact that everything she's ever known has just kind of disappeared. The Night Sisters on Dathomir have been wiped out, at least as far as she knows. Now, of course, we know that there are a handful of survivors, but as far as she knows, they're all wiped out. Dooku has tried to kill her, and she has nowhere else to turn. I just find that story fascinating. It's not specifically a dark side user story because from a certain point of view, it's a Soka story, mm -hmm. at least in the Clone Wars time. So I just like the complexity of the character. Matt, do you have a favorite dark sider that fits Keenan's description? 
Yeah, that was there's, there's some real specific filters you put on us there, Keenan. Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to think about it. I like your you're going with a kind of complex story, Aaron, a complex character. I'm not I'm not a huge fan of the the dark side users as well. I don't relate to them as much. That's hopefully a good thing. But I picked digging deep down into the Star Wars EU lore, uh, Ulic Keldroma. Uh, he was active in the Tales of the Jedi series, which takes place. 4,000 years-ish? Ish. Battle of Yavin? Ish. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. So um, you'll find him in the Tales of Jedi comic series. It's one of the only Star Wars comic series I really read as a kid. And I really liked his story. His is a little more tragic as well. He came from a Jedi family. His mom, he had a brother named Kay who was a Jedi Knight as well. And long story short, he had this big plan, right, to infiltrate a cult of dark side worshipers to kind of like destroy him from the inside out. And what happened? homeboy went to the dark side uh he had a a xr coon was his fellow sith lord they were kind of like joint sith lords together and uh, we of course know uh, xr from the jedi academy trilogy series um and ulik kind of his he was a dark side he was a sith lord he lost his ability to use the force it was taken from him severed by his girl nomi sunrider another cool star wars character from lore uh, after he killed his own brother, spoiler alert, alert. So after that, he renounced the dark side. He went into exile and kind of had a really tragic ending. Uh, he trained one more apprentice on the light side. Things were going really great. And it seemed like he was redeeming himself a little bit. And then he was like killed by some rando spacer. And uh, so he ended. So kind of another tragic, complex story that I thought was pretty fascinating. Now, Keenan, for your second question, listeners, if you've gone through many of these episodes, I am pretty honest. Darth Vader is my favorite character. However, (laughs) I am 45 years old. I am of an age where many fans in my age group or older consider Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker almost like two different characters because for the longest time, all we had was Darth Vader. To some degree, I still think that way. I know they're not. I know Anakin Skywalker is who Darth Vader is, but they feel like different characters to me on some level. Yes, Kenan, the Clone Wars made Anakin more complex. It made Anakin's turn to the dark side have more depth than Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith did. But I'll just be honest, I don't find the character of Anakin Skywalker that interesting. I just don't. And I think it's because I already know where the end point is. I think if we didn't know Darth Vader first, I would find Anakin more interesting. Hmm. Matt, do you have an opinion? I see what you're saying, and I think I like it too. Uh, Anakin's not a favorite character of mine either. Uh, you know, he brought up Clone Wars, and that's great. I love the Clone Wars. I love the depth that it gave to the character. I'm really loving what we're seeing so far in the Ahsoka series. That's almost giving me an even greater appreciation for Anakin, just in the brief glimpses that we've seen so far in that. Yeah, I will say, and I don't want to spoil the show for listeners out there, but Anakin does play a role a very prominent role in one of the episodes. Just that episode makes Anakin more interesting than he has been in any other piece of Star Wars material for me. We're in agreement there, buddy. Nice. Well, thank you again for the email, Keenan. Today's second email comes from Thomas, one of the hosts of the TK331 podcast, which also celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. Thomas says... I've listened to all the Legends Lounge episodes, and I have to say it's a great show. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. You and your guests do a great job talking about what works and what doesn't for you. I may not always agree with your conclusions, but you keep it interesting. I find it interesting slash amusing hearing from different people how they pronounce names and places from a galaxy far, far away. Zahn, Stackpole, and the rest of the authors don't always make it easy for us podcasters. Well, you're right about that. I mean, let's face it. These are in books. It's not like people were meant to speak all of these names out loud. And I think if sometimes the authors, when they wrote them down, were to actually say 
some of the names out loud, they'd be like, I'm just going to change this guy's name to Dan or something. <laughs> Friggin' Zon. Come on, man. Thomas's email continues. I have two questions. First, of the EU books that you haven't read, which one are you looking forward to reading the most? Uh, well, Thomas, it's Crucible, the final novel in the Legends timeline. Of course, you know it wasn't the final one published, but I've never read it. It's one of those handful of books in Legends that I haven't read yet, and I've told myself that it's going to be, since it's the last novel in the timeline, of course, there's some comics that take place afterwards, but since it's the last novel in the timeline, it's going to be the last book I read for this podcast. So I'm waiting to read it nice. at that time. That's that's the one I'm looking forward to the most. Nice. Uh, mine is the whole Fate of the Jedi series, which takes place right before Crucible. Those came out just as my twins were being born, and I never... I. They're Legends books I have not read. I haven't read Fate of the Jedi at all. So looking forward to diving into those. Cool. There's uh, there's some really interesting stuff in those. There's uh, some wacky stuff in those, too, that yeah. we can probably joke around about. Uh, that... I know the high points of what happens right. uh, with certain characters and everything, but I'm looking forward to the wacky. So Thomas's uh, email finishes up. Second, in the Dark Journey episode, uh, that's an episode that I did with Scott. Uh, that was the last one that Scott was on. You said that you go along with what George Lucas says, given that he's the architect of the story. In theory, I agree with this. But in practice, I find it difficult to do since Lucas himself has contradicted and changed a lot of things over the years. The timeline of the Clone Wars being one of the more egregious that immediately springs to mind. How do you reconcile it when George contradicts himself? Uh, I guess I've just mellowed out as I've gotten older. Um, Thomas, some of the things you're talking about here are some of the things that bugged me as a teenager in my early 20s, probably into my late 20s. But I guess I just at some point kind of thought, okay, the continuity isn't perfect but if you take Obi-Wan's quote of looking at things from a certain point of view, most of the things, not all, but most of the things that don't flow perfectly, you can just kind of finesse. You can say, eh, if I just imagine it this way, it fits pretty well. Now, yes, <laughs> when the Clone Wars takes place, there's really nothing that makes that work from how it was originally conceived to the story then that we got on the screen between Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith, and when A New Hope starts. In fact, I remember Pablo Hidalgo on his Twitter feed admitting that there were people that worked at Lucasfilm that were working under the assumption that the Clone Wars took place over a long period of time, five to ten years, taking place about 35 to 40 years before A New Hope, all the way up until close to when George was writing Revenge of the Sith. Then the time period changes. The Clone Wars is a much shorter period of time, only about three years. And with Luke and Leia being born at the end of Revenge of the Sith, now all of a sudden it's only 19 years in the past. So it does make some of the things, particularly in A New Hope, a little weird from a, from a timeline point of view, and there's really nothing you can do to finesse that. But other than that, for the most part, I'm not saying there aren't a few things that bug me, but for the most part, I just kind of let it slide when it comes to continuity and things that, dis that, uh, that, don't, that don't agree. Matt? Mm -hmm. I, I know I was a little long-winded there, but uh, do you have anything for, for Thomas? I agree with you for the most part. You know, what I take for my Bible in Star Wars is obviously the films first. That's number one. Number two is the books. And, you know, in terms of continuity and really establishing certain things, it seems like those guidebooks, the essential guide to whatever, seems to be good resources to kind of like pin your expectations on. 
Um, what George has said, though, matters as well. And because he is the creator of this universe, as you've made very clear. But to me, two and number two and number three, the books and George are really dependent on date and time. <laughs> And you kind of just have to go with the most recent, like theories and ideas develop, you know, George doesn't think the same way about Star Wars now that he thought about when he wrote Splinter of the Mind's Eye, right? Uh, that was canon for George until Empire Strikes Back, you know? So there's things that are fixed in his mind until they're not fixed in his mind anymore. The goalposts are constantly moving in a universe like the expanded universe, and that can be a little frustrating at times. Um, it doesn't bother me that much, though. Finesse and just go with it. That's that's my approach for sure. Thanks for the email, Thomas. Now, listener, if you have a question for the show, like Keenan and Thomas did, you can email me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send me a tweet at legendslounge1. And if you'd like to get your voice on the show, you can record an audio question and email it in. Just please help me out and record it in MP3 or MP4 audio format. Now it's time for today's book, Traitor by Matthew Stover. Matt, are you ready? Let's kick the tires and light the fires. Listener, grab yourself a drink, and let's head in to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. <laughs> The story begins in the Yuzhan Vong seed ship. Jason Solo hangs suspended in the embrace of pain. The unbearable pain it inflicts is compounded by the emotional turmoil he feels over the death of his brother Anakin and his betrayal by Vergeer. The strange alien visits Jason, Jason every so often. He doesn't know how often, as all sense of time is lost. But on one occasion, Vergeer speaks to him. Jason asks her why the Vong are torturing him, but she refuses to answer, responding only with more questions. Then Vergeer does the unthinkable. She takes the force from Jason. He doesn't know how, but where he used to feel the force flowing, he now feels only emptiness. Vergeer tells Jason that since he's dead anyway, he doesn't need the force. Vergeer whispers in Jason's ear that everything she's telling him is a lie and to not believe anything she says. And Jason is left even more confused and empty, knowing only the embrace of pain. Slowly, Jason begins to understand the embrace of pain. It takes him just to the breaking point, then eases off and allows him to recover before hitting him again. He learns, with Vergeer's help, that pain can be a teacher. It can make Jason unbreakable. While he doesn't know why this is happening to him, the Vong have never even questioned Jason, he now knows that his pain can become an ally. Meanwhile, Naminor reports to Warmaster Savong La that the Jason Solo experiment is proceeding exactly as he planned. The Jedi is learning to thrive on pain and will eventually turn completely to the true way of the Yuzhan Vong. Imagine, the executor says, how destructive it will be to New Republic morale if one of their heroes, a solo Skywalker, turned on them. He can fulfill the prophecy, acting as Yun Yamka, the warrior god, as his twin sister Jaina acts as Yun Harla, the trickster. Together, the two will be the great sacrifice that would lead to total victory. Safong La is intrigued. Eventually, mercifully, Jason is released from the embrace of pain. Vergeer arrives, escorts Jason from his cell, and reveals where he is. In a seed ship that will give birth to a new home planet for the Yuzhan Vong. Jason discovers the seed ship itself contains its own world, complete with hills, jungles, swamps, and artificial sunlight, and slaves. Species from all over the galaxy, all working under the watchful eyes of Yuzhan Vong guards. Vergeer says this world is a playground for Duryums. Much larger and more complex than Yamask war coordinators, Duryums are essentially world coordinators. 
They're fully intelligent, fully aware, and fully capable of making their own decisions. Vergier says the 12 duriums on the seed ship are in a state of infancy. Each controls its own group of slaves and is able to practice with them here in this horrific playground or nursery, as it comes to be known. After this time of preparation, one durium will be chosen to become the world brain for Yuzhan Tar, the new Yuzhan Vong homeworld. The others will just be destroyed. Jason scans the nursery in disbelief, when suddenly Vergier reveals a sharp hook of bone and stabs him in the chest. She implants a slave seed inside Jason, a sort of organic microchip with a telepathic link to one of the duriums. It's through these seeds that the duriums control their slaves, and the way they control them is through pain. It's an agonizing process for Jason and the slaves, the searing pain sending them from duty to duty in the nursery until they find exactly what the durium wanted them to do, at which point the pain subsides. Over time, however, Jason's relationship with the durium changes. As it notices Jason's high tolerance to pain, it begins to pay him more attention. But by doing so, the durium neglects its other slaves, and its section of the nursery falls into disrepair. So, the two form something of a partnership. The durium allows Jason to care for the other slaves, who then produce more for the durium. In fact, the domain of Jason's durium flourishes more than the others. Little does Jason know, Naminor and Vergier are behind it all, and this partnership between Jason and the durium is exactly what they're hoping for. For her part, Vergier continues to mystically teach Jason, frustrating him to no end as she seems to answer every one of his questions with a question of her own. She uses her tears to heal the wound in his chest from her bone hook, explaining that she can adjust the makeup of her tears on a molecular level to essentially heal any infirmity. Obviously a Force user, Jason asks Vergier if she's Jedi or Sith, and she retorts that those may not be the only two options. Vergier then leaves him with a burning question. If the Force is life, how can there be life without the Force? Meanwhile, Yuzhan Vong shapers are preparing Coruscant to be transformed into a replica of the Vong homeworld Yuzhan Tar. Its orbit is shifted closer to the sun, and one of its three moons is pulverized into a brilliant rainbow-colored planetary ring. Terraforming continues, and even natural rain is reintroduced to the Coruscant system. In short, the planet is nearly ready for seedfall. Speaking of seedfall, the shapers on the seed ship prepare to evaluate the duriums to determine which has progressed enough to be planted on Coruscant and from which Yuzhan Tar can flourish. It's then that Jason acts. Using his connection with the durium, he is able to summon dozens of amphistaffs from their grove to wrap themselves around him, acting as sort of a living armor, and giving Jason dozens of lethal weapons. Jason kills four Vong guards with ease, then begins to attack the rest of the nursery. As Jason leaves body after body of Yuzhan Vong in his wake, the Durium orders its slaves to set fire to the landscape and attack the warriors guarding the other Duriums. The result is devastating, but it is somewhat of a diversion. Jason's real targets are the other Duriums, the massive, sentient blobs protected on an island in the middle of the nursery. Jason reaches the island protected by his fellow slave fighters and begins to methodically kill each durium. He's about to kill the final durium, his durium, when Vergier intervenes, modifying her tears to be a chemical paralytic, and knocks Jason out cold. Jason awakes on a strange planet full of high hills and deep valleys, with varying stages of vegetation growth covering nearly everything. It's beautiful. Vergier is there with him and explains that this beautiful creation is Yuzhan Tar, 
and it's being manufactured by the durium, his durium. And it's because of him that the durium is even there. He should feel proud. Vergeer then helps him realize where they really are. They're standing on Coruscant. Jason hates it. He asks how long they have to stay there, and Vergeer says he can stay or go at his leisure, revealing that she removed the slave seed, revealing that she removed the slave seed from his chest. Jason doesn't know how he feels about that, thinking about the relationship he developed with the durium, how it had almost become a part of him. Jason can almost still feel the seed within him, even after its removal. He begins to walk and invites Vergeer to follow him. They trek for weeks, Jason leading and Vergeer following, avoiding the Vong patrols and scrounging what they need to survive. In the depths of Coruscant, they come upon a place strong with the dark side of the Force. Jason can feel it, can feel the raw anger and passion. Just then, a horde of Yuzhan Vong warriors attack, led by Naminor, and Vergeer seems to know what's going on. Jason can suddenly feel the force again, and in doing so, he sees red, unleashing a torrent of dark side energy that kills all the Vong warriors and nearly kills Vergeer as well. In the aftermath, Vergeer claims that the force he unleashed is not dark, that there is no dark side or light side of the force. There is just the force, and if he uses it for evil purposes, it's him that is dark, not the Force. Jason can't deny this and runs away. Now deep in the underworld of what was once Coruscant, Jason hears a voice beckoning him to follow. Jason looks and sees Anakin? Jason knows it can't be real, an illusion. Or maybe it's a Force ghost, like when Uncle Luke would see Obi-Wan Kenobi or Yoda. But no, he cannot feel this presence in the Force. That means it has to be a Yuzhan Vong posing as Anakin. Fueled by his rage, Jason chases after the imposter who would dare masquerade as his little brother, right into a trap. Turning a corner, Jason runs straight into what turns out to be the mouth of a gigantic Yuzhan Vong monster who swallows him. Inside the beast, he finds a human girl who is slowly being digested. Jason reaches out to save her but feels so weak, so useless now. It makes him angry. All of this makes him angry. But as the red tide of anger sweeps over him, Jason feels powerful. And he embraces that power, that anger. And in doing so, he succeeds in freeing the girl. After what feels like weeks, Jason, now alone, arrives at the destination he's been seeking. His family home on Coruscant. Sitting at what was once his kitchen table, and which was now being taken over by Vong vegetation, Anakin enters the room and sits with him. Jason knows this Anakin can't be real. At best, it's a force ghost like Obi-Wan or Yoda. At worst, it's a trick by Vergeer. But as Jason talks to this projection of Anakin, he feels intense remorse over giving in to his anger, even to save a life. Anakin tries to convince him that it's not that bad that Jason's dark side ain't all that dark. Jason begins to give into despair and descend into darkness when suddenly Anakin is replaced by Vergeer. It's her. The real her. Jason admits that he doesn't know who he is anymore or what really is the truth. Vergeer responds, tapping his chest where the Vong slave seed was once implanted. And upon her doing, all of a sudden, Jason finds himself at seemingly one with the Force. Not the Force as he'd previously understood it, but a living connection to everything that is, everything that has been, and everything that will be. And this includes the Yuzhan Vong. He can feel the Vong as well. Naminor and twelve warriors enter, obviously led there by Vergeer. Naminor tells Jason that the Force is useless to a god like him, and that Jason needs to take his place in the pure light of truth, the truth that Jason is indeed a god. Naminor then pulls out Anakin's lightsaber and offers it to Jason. With an accompanying choice, take it 
and stay who you are, a flailing force user with no direction, or learn the true way of the Yuzhan Vong, embracing your potential to become Yun Yamka. After a moment, Jason refuses the lightsaber, giving it to Vergier, and chooses Naminor's way. Why not? Elsewhere, Jedi Knight Ganner Rysode is chasing down reports that Jason Solo is alive. He follows one rumor to a refugee ship where he finds four Yuzhan Vong, conspicuous by their absence in the Force. As he confronts them, Ganner realizes there's another in their party. It's Jason Solo. But Jason takes Ganner's lightsaber, breaks it, and informs his companions that they will not kill Ganner, but take him with them as a prisoner. Before being drugged, the last thing Ganner thinks is, Jason Solo is a traitor. When Ganner awakens, he hears Jason tell his Yuzhan Vong companions that if Jason is to flawlessly perform the sacrifice of his twin sister, he needs to practice on Ganner. But it's a con, and later, Jason tells Ganner that he will not be sacrificed, but he's going to die. And if Ganner wants to make his death count for something, he'll go along with Jason's plan, which includes Jason dying as well. Jason says Ganner needs to act as a sacrificial lamb to get them close to the world brain so that Jason can... Well, he doesn't really explain that quite yet. Jason demonstrates his trust that Ganner will do the right thing by giving Ganner Anakin's lightsaber. Ganner's confused, in complete disbelief, but he agrees to go along with Jason's plan. They then make their way in a grand procession of Yuzhan Vong, Naminor prominently among them, to the Well of the World Brain, which resides in what used to be the Galactic Senate Hall. Jason steps up to the grand doors of the hall, makes a show of Ganner, steps inside, and then slams the doors closed with the Force, leaving Jason and Ganner alone inside for the time being. Quickly, they make their way to the Grand Convocation Chamber, where senators from around the galaxy used to run that same galaxy. It's there that the World Brain resides, a large, fleshy, tentacled lump in a pool of toxic-looking liquid at the bottom of the chamber. Jason tells Ganner about secret tunnels underneath the chamber, urging him to make a run for it. But Ganner refuses to leave Jason, and as the Vong finally open the door, Ganner makes a choice. Not to be the hero, as he'd always wanted to be, but to be the guy who holds off the enemy long enough so that the real hero can accomplish what he needs to do. With that conviction, Ganner Rizode draws Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber and goes about the business of death, slaying warrior after warrior, using the Amethyst Blade to build a fortress of the dead. The Vong refused to do the dishonorable thing by blowing up Ganner or some other safer route. Plus, anything on that scale could harm the world brain. So they keep coming one by one, two by two, three by three, and Ganner keeps killing them. Naminor views all of this happening and he's ready to kill Vergier when she suddenly appears. It is her student that is causing all this. Vergier doesn't disagree and suggests that Naminor escape in the ship he'd hidden away in case of emergency and that he should take her with him. If he ends up being captured by the New Republic, there's a chance that she, Mara Jade Skywalker's savior, could buy them both clemency. Naminor agrees. Meanwhile, the world brain takes Jason into its tentacled grasp and pulls him into the fluid. Jason feels the monster's anger, its betrayal against the boy it once considered a friend and who tried to kill it. Jason, through his mental connection with the world brain, expresses his regret at the pain he's caused, but also accepts the pain, serenely intimating to the world brain that they are one in the Force, that their pain their joy, their existence, is all a single, shared whole. Beneath the former Senate chambers, Naminor and Vergier arrive at the escape craft. But just as they are boarding, Vergier draws Jason's green lightsaber, 
and forces Namanor off the ship, capturing him in a swirl of living vines. Yeah. Well, Ganner continues to fight, losing himself more and more in the battle. He feels joy as he dispatches his enemies, even as he senses their fear at facing him, even as he senses that this dance is coming to an end. Laughing, he uses the force to begin pushing the duracrete of the building. Now Jason, now reconciled with the world brain, feels what is happening with Ganner and urges the world brain to release him so he can help. And as Jason races to Ganner's side, he's stopped by Vergier, who appears and insists that Ganner's fate is decided and that Jason will die as well if he goes to him. In the story of your life, is this your best ending? Vergier asks and gives Jason back his lightsaber. Anguished, Jason agrees to go with Frigier, leaving Ganner to his fate. And what a fate it is. For just then, the walls of the chamber begin to collapse around Jason and Frigier. Jason feels Ganner's mortal existence wink out, as well as that of his Vong opponents. He then hears a voice that sounds very much like Ganner's, urging him to go. And so Jason does, escaping with Vergier. The story ends with Jason and Vergier aboard their escape ship. Jason's unsure how to proceed, how to reach out to his family again, what to tell them after all he'd been through and all he had done. His thoughts also turn to Ganner and how no one will know of the power and the force that he demonstrated during his last stand against the Yuzhan Vong. Vergier tells Jason of a vision she's had in which, years from now, the Vong whisper of the Ganner, a legendary Jedi warrior who stands as guardian to the lands of the dead, refusing to allow souls to pass back to trouble the land of the living. Jason, for his part, tells Vergier that he seduced the world brain into working against the Yuzhan Vong to sabotage the work on Yuzhantar little by little. Everything is going to go just a little bit wrong for them from now on, Jason claims. The lesson Jason hopes to teach them is that fanaticism is self-defeating, that they can never expect to force everything to be exactly what they want it to be. Vergier tells Jason how proud she is of this moment, when the student surpasses her as the teacher. Is that what we are? Jason asks. She says yes but also that she is his student. And together, they have some hard lessons to learn together. Time for a break. When we return, Matt and I will talk more about Traitor by Matthew Stover. I'm Aaron Motes. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. Thank you for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, where we celebrate the books from Star Wars Legends. But let me take a moment and recommend a book from Star Wars canon. Aftermath, Empire's End is the conclusion to the best-selling trilogy about the final days of the Empire. Nora Wexley and her team hunt for Imperial Grand Admiral Ray Sloan, who's searching for the mysterious Gallius Rex. And it all culminates at one last battle on the planet Jakku. Will Nora and Ray Sloan be able to stop Rex from implementing the Emperor's final plan? Find out in Aftermath, Empire's End by Chuck Wendig, the final book in the Aftermath trilogy. Welcome back to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes, and today... Matt and I are talking about Traitor by Matthew Stover, book number 13 in the New Jedi Order series. Wow, 13 already. 13 out of 19. We only have uh, six more after this. Ah! Well, I was going to, you know, you've mentioned this is your favorite book. So I it want is. to like take the hosting duties away from you for just a sec and just ask you the question. Why do you love it so much? I want to hear from you. It's a little odd because I think people who know me and know what I like would not have picked this as my favorite book in this series. 
And mm. I've said it before in all of the books of legends that I've read, which to this point is about 165. I've only got wow. somewhere between eight and 10 to go. This is in that little group of about five that are that is my favorite in Legends. Wow. I think the thing I like the most, two, two things, let me say this. I think two things I like the most. One, I like Jason trying to figure everything out. Usually, I'm not the biggest fan of staying inside a character's head. But I think the way Stover writes this book, I'm right there with Jason. I'm trying to figure out how Jason is going to survive this. It's not that Jason's trying to understand some mystery. He's just trying to survive. How is he going to survive this? And in the first 12 books of the series, we have Jason constantly questioning his position and the Jedi's position in this galactic battle. What do the Jedi want to be? What does Jason want to be? It's an interesting question. At times, it gets a little old, <laughs> and I think we've talked about that before. Yes, we have. But in this one, that's not the question. The question is, how am I going to survive? And just when Jason is basically torn down to his base level to build himself back up, that's what I find interesting. That and the cat and mouse game between Jason and Vergier. Oh, my heavens, yeah. Those are the two things that I really love about this book. And it's probably why it resonates more with me than the other books in this series, even though this is my favorite series in Legends. Uh, there are individual moments in other books that resonate more. Of course, everyone knows Chewbacca's death. That's going to resonate with everyone. But as a whole, this book resonates more with me than the others. Wow. I love that. And, you know, uh, Matthew Stover, he wrote one of the most revered books in Star Wars, which among Star Wars fans anyways, which is the Revenge of the Sith novelization, right? People yep. love that book, me included. Um, did, did you like what he did here? Does, does some of his greatness translate over to Traitor? Well, sure. I mean... Which one did he write first? But it would be, yeah, it'd be Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That was like 2000. Revenge of the Sith came out in 2003. I think Three. the novelization came out just before it. And Traitor here came out in 2002. Oh. So he was probably working on both at about the same he could time. He working, yeah. I don't yeah, know. For sure. I'd have to go into the computer here and look up the publishing dates to see which one actually yeah. came out first. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I think Stover is generally very, very good. As the other co-host of the TK331 podcast, likes, Crystal, likes to say, everyone's got a stinker in them, though. And Stover also <laughs> did write one of the books that I am not a fan of, and that's Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mindor. Oh yeah, uh, you mentioned that's not you not a fan yeah. of that one, but okay, okay. I can't deny that Traitor and the Revenge of the Sith novelization, as far as Star Wars books go, in my opinion, they are on that top tier. Yeah, one thing I really liked about his writing in this one is the very like visceral, almost kind of icky description of Vong technology throughout. Like you really get technology, biotech and, and the Vong worlds and everything. He'd use words like moist and puckered and slurping. And it just gave this very icky feeling that really put me into like seeing this stuff in a different light than I saw 
with the other authors even. Sure. Like one of the descriptions with like the duriums and almost like the what I picture as like neon green toxic waste sludge that uh-huh. it's sitting in. I, I'm almost picturing a blob about the size of like a house that ha- that is also kind of like an octopus. You know, yeah. with tentacles all over the place. But the tentacles aren't just coming out one area. It's coming out all parts of its body and everything. Um, it was called a world brain. So I kind of pictured a blob that had a little bit of a brain-like structure. But mm-hmm. with like eight to ten tentacles coming out all over the place. I also pictured a big eye for some reason. Um, I, I don't remember any description saying it had an eye. But I always pretty. I always picture one huge like eyeball right in the middle of the blob. Yeah, when you think of something sitting in liquid with tentacles and everything, you kind of just imagine an eyeball being there. I don't know. But yeah. Yeah, there's some gross stuff in there. Meaty slap was a word he it was a description he used a couple of times. And, you know, that's just very visceral kind of gross language, but it really I think puts us in that world. I liked it. In the first episode that you and I did, I talked about how occasionally I wanted the authors to tone down the description of the tortures. Mm -hmm. Of course, the beginning of this book is nothing but torture. Jason in the embrace of pain. And while there are a few visceral descriptions of like very graphic, like Jason could feel a tendon in his shoulder pop or this, that, and the other for the most part, it's just, he keeps talking about the white. Yeah, the feeling. What's going on in his mind? The white, the red, the black. And eventually, you understand what all of these things mean. They just call them the colors. Uh huh. The white is pain. The red is anger. The black is when Jason would lose consciousness. Black out, yeah. Uh huh. And I thought that was a really cool way to describe the torture without constantly being real graphic because Jason's in the embrace of pain for a long time. That is true. I like that as well. And you're right. He doesn't give a key. Like when you read white, it means this, (laughs) but you figure it out after a while because of the writing. One thing about that, when Kat and I did our last episode, I mentioned to her that, when Wedge says we're going to hit them with the Empire, that was one of the lines that has always I've always remembered from Legends. Three lines. There's that one. There's at the end of the Air of the Empire trilogy in the Last Command when Thrawn is killed and he says it was so artistically done. Mm-hmm. But this book has the line that has always <gasps> stayed with me the most. And hit me from the first time I read it to now, I say this to myself for some reason. I don't know why. Like once a week, it it's unreal. And the weird part about it is like a lot of people who get the line in Empire Strikes Back wrong. You know, they don't say, uh-huh. no, I am your father. I they always father. say, Luke, I am your father. I remember this line just a little incorrectly. Um, I always have. I've got, I don't know why. I've got two in my mind. I want to see which one it is. All right. That it could be. So it's it's actually toward the beginning. In my okay. paperback oh, copy, it's, not. it's only on page 29. Okay. And for some reason in my head, I've always remembered Jason began eating the white. But the, really? the actual line is, now he begins to eat the white it's just it's the moment that jason finally understands that just because he's in pain he can't continue to think to reason to try to plot how he's going to get out of here and just because he's in pain he can still go about doing whatever it is he needs to do in order to survive yeah, he's embracing the pain, right? He's why do you embracing think that stuck it. Stuck with you? I, I don't know why. I don't. I. I uh, I'm trying to remember 
where I was in life when I read this the first time. You know, it came yeah, out in 2002. Like, were, you having, were you going through a rough? T- were you going through a rough time? No, <laughs> I I don't know. I was just for some reason found it a really cool line. Uh, at this point in time, I would yeah. have been a news reporter, only two years out of college. You know, and first two years out of college, you're struggling. I don't, you yep. know. Mm-hmm. And I guess it was just. If I would relate it to myself, which I'm not really sure I did, but if I did, it was one of those things, yes, you're struggling. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that just because you're struggling, you cannot still enjoy your day. You know, you cannot still decide this is what I want to do in life. This is what... doesn't mean you're weak. Doesn't mean you're weak. Doesn't mean that I have to stew in my own dark thoughts or whatever it is in my room. If I want to, you know, I, at the time, you know, I didn't have a girlfriend, nothing like that. It doesn't mean that there's anything really wrong in my world. Mm -hmm. I wasn't where I wanted to be, but that didn't mean that I still couldn't enjoy my life at the time. Yeah. And that might be thinking a little too deep about it, but I guess that's just the reason that line resonated with me. And like I said, it's still a line that for some reason it pops into my head like once a week all the time. (laughs) It pops in incorrectly. It's Jason Uh started eating the white, which is not the line, but that's the way I remember it. Right. Yeah. I think there's a ton to mine from that. I love that. Uh, one of my favorite lines, and I made sure to put it in my summary because I liked it so much. Well, there's two. It's the, you're dark ain't all that dark. Or I don't even know if I'm getting it right. That Anakin says to to Jason, meaning that don't beat yourself up so much, Matt. And um, And is this really how you imagine your story ending or something like that? Right? Right. So... There's a lot of good stuff to pull from these books that we almost subconsciously apply to our lives. Sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. question for you, what's Vergier's deal? The question that just keeps, just keeps popping up. This question has more lives than Naminor does. I swear. Um, okay. Here's what I think about Vergier. I don't think you can live among a culture for 50 years and not develop some sort of compassion for them, right? Or some sort of connection for them. Uh, I don't feel that she's completely wrong, but I feel that she does have compassion for them. I think that what she's saying and what she's trying to teach Jason is true. I, I feel transparency there. I feel that she's being honest there, that she does have a certain amount of care and compassion for the Yuzhan Vong. At the same time, she's from this galaxy. Well, not this galaxy. She's from the Star Wars galaxy. The galaxy far, far away. We'll call it that. She's from this galaxy. She she has compassion for her people as well. Uh, I think she's honestly trying to walk that line, man, where she doesn't want to see one side annihilate the other side because she cares about them both. She's the referee in the hockey fight. I'm a hockey guy. You know this. Standing between the two combatants with her hands outstretched, trying to keep them away from e- from completely obliterating each other. I think that's what she's trying to do. And in Jason Solo, she has found someone who can stand at her side and help her do that. Someone who is feeling a lot of angst about his place in the galaxy and how the force works or how it should work. He's always thinking about ethical implications and about if the good side is really good and if the bad side is really bad. He's not the human wrecking ball that Anakin Skywalker was. He's not the, he's not the, you know, and you've got Jaina Solo who's almost more interested in piloting than she is in the force. You've got a kid that's very deeply thoughtful about his place in the universe and his place with the force and who's also very empathetic as well. We find out from what is the new Jed, not new Jedi, the Jedi, new Jedi Academy, the Jedi Academy, the, uh, the, yeah, the, 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 the YA books. young Jedi Knights, young Jedi Knights. There stories. you go. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll get we, there at we some learned. point. We'll get there at some point. We will. 
we we uh, you did a lot in the in your primer stuff, which I really liked. Um, but uh, you you see a Jason that's very empathetic, especially with other creatures, right? He was always having different pets and things like that, so he naturally has a connection to other life forms. And I think Vergier, through whatever means she was able to ascertain this has found the guy, and that's Jason Solo, who she feels can stand at her side and keep these two factions from completely obliterating each other. Um, so she's not necessarily on the side of the New Republic. She's not necessarily on the side of the Yuzhan Vong. She just wants to see both get along. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it did. Um, I went a little long-winded there, but uh, what do you think? Am I completely off base? I think I would agree with 80, 80% maybe of what you were saying. The, the one thing I... Can I get 82? Uh, yeah, sure. 82. <laughs> the, the one part that I think I would disagree with is that Vergier is... It's, it's weird trying to explain this knowing how the story ends. Sure. Let me say this. At this point in time, I would agree with you. I would agree that Vergier is trying to keep these two factions from mutual annihilation. Mm -hmm. By the end of the series, if I were to go back and analyze everything Vergier does, I think I would probably interpret her intentions a different way. I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it yet, but is still listening to the podcast, and this is the way they're consuming the content. Mm -hmm. But I do think by the end of the series, you can see the stuff that Virgir has done now and interpret it differently than you would interpret it at this point in time. One thing that was kind of interesting that someone else pointed out as I was reading what other people had to say about this, this great book was talking about the similarities that you see with Jason and Vergier and Luke and Yoda. It's kind of a more twisted, much more twisted version, not kind of, a much more twisted dark version, but Luke and the Swamps of Dagobah. Um, you know, Vergier kind of breaking down preconceptions that that, uh, that Jason would have had, just like Yoda did with Luke, rebuilding their way of thinking, philosophical discussions about the nature of life in the forest, you know. Uh, all of that stuff. So there's kind of a nice little interesting mirror there. There's definitely an allusion to Yoda in Vergier. Philosophically. Very different philosophy. Very, very different. Um, Almost polar opposite, actually. Close. Yeah, close. Um, I think at one time I agreed with Vergier's philosophy on the force that it does not have a light side or a dark side. It is just the force. Mm -hmm. I think I've gone away from that philosophy as I've gotten a little older, but the way you tap into it, the way it gives you its powers, I guess, for lack of a better term, that is on some level, the plate of the Jedi. That's their burden in on some measure is how they utilize the force. Right. What emotions they take into it. Sure. Right? Sure. Yeah. Yoda's instruction to Luke before going into the tree cave on Dagobah. Or not instruction, but what's in there? Only what you bring with you. Right. I like that idea. The burden of the Jedi is to learn to constantly be self vigilant in how you are approaching situations. Right. Yeah. And that is one, a really good example. I think you and I talked about that once before years ago. My single favorite <laughs> thing in star Wars is taking Yoda's teachings from Luke going into the dark side cave on Dagobah and layering those teachings over Luke going into the throne room in return of the Jedi. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Because if you just 
take the words that Yoda says at different times when Luke is in the throne room in Return of the Jedi, it's almost like Yoda is speaking to him. But it's more that Luke has finally understood what Yoda was trying to teach him. It's landing. Yeah. Exactly. It's the same words. It's two different sides of the force. Luke in the cave almost gives into his dark side. I know it's just a vision, but you see the way he attacks and destroys Vader. And what happens? He sees himself. Mm -hmm. He's really destroying himself. And then what happens in the throne room, Luke defeats Vader. I'm not going to deny that Luke may have been close to touching the dark side because I think he was pretty close. Pretty dang, yep. But he's able to finally fully understand what Yoda was trying to teach him, pull himself back, and it's his compassion for Vader that defeats the Emperor. His compassion for Vader. Yes, a lot of times we talk about it was Leia, right? It was his love for Leia that motivates him. But it is also that compassion for his father, more so. His feelings of protectiveness for his sister is almost what made him clip over to the other side, right? That's when exactly. Darth Vader knew what, he knew what button to push there, and Vader pushed it, and Luke responded. <laughs> exactly. But in my opinion... Seeing his, seeing Vader there broken, particularly after yeah. Luke takes his hand off and seeing that there's mm -hmm. no hand there and finally understanding everything that his father has lost in becoming Darth Vader. Uh huh. Losing his physical hand, losing his son and his daughter. And finally saying, that's enough. There's been enough violence in this family. And what's the first thing he does? Turns his lightsaber off, stands up, turns to Palpatine, and throws it away. Right. That is yeah. what I think defeats the Emperor. That finally he gets through to Vader. And in that moment, lying there is when Vader ceases to be and Anakin Skywalker returns. Anakin returns. Beautifully said. So, uh, yeah, it gives me a, I want to go watch that scene now. Someone needs, we need to make a YouTube video of Yoda talking over that, that throne room scene. Like just have Yoda's audio piping in at certain points. Yeah. And it, really it's cool. not, it's not all in order. And sure. I may be looking a little too deeply into it, but like you said, what's in there? Only what you take with you. Mm -hmm. um, Luke puts his belt on. Your weapons, you will not need them. How does Luke eventually win? Throwing his weapon away. He throws the... You, yeah. you know? All of that stuff. Um, like I said, when he slices Vader's head off in the cave, he sees his face. In the throne room, when he slices Vader's hand off, he sees... He looks at his hand. His hand. Ooh, yeah. This is awesome. Listeners, I just made a head-exploding motion with my hands. <laughs> Aaron and I are on camera, so he sees it. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I, I always like taking all of Yoda's words, specifically from that scene with the cave... There, there's one other line he says, and it's at the beginning of Return of the Jedi, when Luke goes to see him before Yoda dies, that I think also uh -huh. you can juxtapose over that scene. Um, at some point, maybe some point this weekend, I'll just type down all the lines and I'll email it to you, and then you can watch the Return of the Jedi scene and see where those lines all match up. That would be so fun. Um, if you get a chance, I'd love that. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's my favorite thing in Star Wars. I'm sure... Other people have noticed it, so man, man. But but good on you. There are a lot more smarter people than me that are more deep into Star Wars than I am. That I'm sure they've noticed it forever. 
So, well, first time for me. So good on you. I like what Vergier teaches though. And it lines up with a lot of what we're saying. I don't like all of what she teaches, but she does make the point to Jason that intent matters. Intent matters when it comes to using the force. Jason has always been so action oriented thinking, what should I do? What should I do? Not so much. Why are you doing it? What should I do? And he's handcuffed, right? He doesn't know what to do. So he doesn't do anything. And she teaches him it's why you're doing it, right? And it's kind of more of a humanist view of like people hold moral responsibility. There is a moral responsibility to why you're doing what you're doing. And that very much comes up with Luke Skywalker in the throne room with Darth Vader. You know, like good intent is not, Vergier teaches good intent is not enough to justify all actions. Like you can't go just slaughtering a bunch of people as long as you don't get angry about it. I'm serene, but I'm slaughtering people. You know, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. There needs to be intention behind this. And she kind of does this, Aaron, to justify her reasons for torturing Jason, right? Which I don't know is is the best thing to do. Sure. She, she says, I had to put you through this. What she's essentially saying that, I did, I tortured you, yes, but I did it in good faith. I did it because I needed to teach you something. You needed to learn something. And yeah, he does come out of it learning something, but it, you know, this will date us a little bit. In our last episode, we, we talked about some things that dated us too. This will date us too as well. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Jack Bauer in 24, you know, constantly resorting to less than ethical and moral means to get the job done, Right. And he would say, I, I had to do it to be able to, you know, for the greater good or to save everyone. Vergier kind of does that too. And I don't know. What do you think? Is she on base with that whole idea? Is there some truth to that? Um, There might be. I think we're on some level. It's now um, a personal moral question. If good people do bad things. For a good thing, then was it worth it? It's almost uh, do the ends justify the means type question. And can one still be a Jedi in this case if you're doing it, right? Correct. When it comes to Vergier, that part I don't know. At least with Jason, a lot of times when she was doing these things, she had somehow taken the force from him. I understand Vergier's teachings from the point of view of she needs Jason to move forward with his life and move forward in this conflict with the Yuzhan Vong. I don't think I would agree with Vergier if this crisis was not going on. Because of this crisis, she had to do something. Yeah. Her teaching had to be harsh to get through to Jason, to stop his stasis. You know, we talked we talked back in our uh, roundtable forum. Jason's character, while really interesting, for a long time, he's just stuck in one place. He yep. doesn't move. Absolutely. And frustratingly so. Right. And in this may be the way Vergier figured out how to get Jason to move. She had to completely break him down, completely make him fall to despair and hopelessness in order to realize that he can move forward. He doesn't have to just sit on that rock and contemplate the universe. Sooner or later, you have to act something. Yeah, because he didn't have that weight of how do I use the force or what do I do still on his shoulders. It was gone. It was taken from him. So what does he learn from that? He learns how to trust in himself to learn and make mistakes and to arrive at actionable answers, things that he can go out and do, solutions that he can implement. Um, 
there's a there's a phrase out there you can lead a man to knowledge but you can't make him think right he was trying to just find knowledge just try to find answers Virgir's teaching him don't trust anything anyone says that's what she's saying with her one line right everything you hear is a lie what she's trying to say to him i think is people will tell you things but go and figure it out for yourself don't just blindly trust in what other people have to say Usually that involves some sort of action, Jason. Get up, get moving, figure it out. It's more than just words. It's more than just an answer that will suddenly come to your brain. She teaches him that he needs to go out and get what he wants. Be truly independent. Be responsible for your own progression. And she, like you said, needed to break him down a little bit. Throw him through some boot camp, right? Yeah. Um, everything I tell you is a lie. And everything I tell you is the truth. She says those lines in this book. What line in Star Wars most illustrates that? And that's Obi-Wan telling Luke, Darth Vader betrayed and murdered your father. That's both a lie and the truth. From a certain point of view. Exactly. (laughs) You sly little devil, you Obi-Wan. Yeah. Matthew Stover knows what he's doing when he's writing Star Wars. In my opinion, he knows what he's doing. Well, before we wrap up here, Matt, was there anything else you wanted to talk about with the book? Uh, We've had a great discussion. I do feel like we need to pour one out for Ganner. What a great ending, right? The Ganner. What a great way to go. And just a tiny spoiler, listeners, for those of you who haven't read the last parts of the New Jedi Order. Yes, Ganner is in fact dead. He's gone, (laughs) but he still plays a part. He still has a part to play amongst the Yuzhan Vong in the last six stories uh, of the series. Yes. Yes. Um, As I was prepping for this episode, I came across an article, one of the 20 or the 20 most memorable moments of the EU and uh, Ganner's death made that list of the top 20 things ganner's death scene and speaking of ganner's so. death we also know that stover must be a tolkien fan because what was the lo- end line of one of the things none shall pass yep <laughs> i'm sure everyone that's either read tolkien or seen the lord of the rings movies thought of uh, gandalf right there <laughs> ganner gandalf none shall pass <laughs> Ganner Dolph, something like that. Yeah. All right, Matt. Hey. Well, it's almost time to go. But last thing, we have received a new Star Wars character grouping. And today's group is from Keenan, one of the people who wrote an email in the first part of the show. Keenan sent in his ideal Star Wars road trip crew. Yeah, he'd want to hit the road with, get this, guys, Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, Din Djarin, Grogu, and R2-D2. What do you think, Aaron? Fantastic. Fantastic yeah. road trip crew, Keenan. But I have to ask, what kind of vehicle are we taking? Mm. As soon as you, I read your email, I went online and started looking up great road trip vehicles, and I came across the 1988 Jeep Wagoneer, wood paneling, down the wood sides, paneling. Yeah, Matt, what do you think of the road trip? I think it's great. Uh, I like your choice of vehicle as well. I think maybe an old van too. I just watched their latest season of Stranger Things, and I'm thinking like the pizza delivery van they drive around in that would be fun. Um, I was thinking about positioning within the car. So you've got Han Solo; he's going to be the driver. Oh, absolutely! Right? Han, I wouldn't let anyone else drive. He wouldn't let. Yeah, anyone else it's drive. no question. I'm thinking R2 in the passenger seat, just with navigating and stuff like that. Uh, Grogu would get irritating after a while if he doesn't have snackies and a lot of toys. Well, you also but, have to put him in a baby seat. I mean, you, you right? Yeah. You know, he's he's too so tiny. He's, he's too short somewhere. for the uh, seat belts. So you got to put him in the baby right. seat. Put him in a baby his little round carrier thing. Maybe you can seat belt that in. Um, Luke would be the one who would want to stop at all the historical areas and take pictures and things like that. Oh, we got to stop here. It's a historical monument or whatever. Um, I feel like Din Djarin would sleep for a lot of the trip, but he'd be pretty fun to talk to while he was awake. So. I think Dan would also just get 
a l- you wouldn't hear from him, you know, because he's a pretty quiet guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. But I think he would also just get frustrated with the banter going on between Luke and Han. <laughs> you know, because let's face it. He put on his headphones. and just... As great of friends as they are, they bicker a lot. They bicker a lot. <laughs> he'd be like, you know what? You guys keep driving. I'm going to ride the jetpack for a while. And he'd go out the window and just fly beside the van. <laughs> Thank you for the list, Keenan. Thanks, Keenan. Yep. Now, listener, if you want to send in your Star Wars character grouping, or if you have a question or comment for the show, you can email me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send a tweet at legendslounge1. Time to wrap up, Matt. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure. And if the listeners would like to contact you or if they would like to check out the Davos Fingers podcast, how can they do that? Uh, Look for me on Twitter at at Thackalanch. That's T-H-A-C-K-A-Lanch. Um, You can find the Davos Fingers podcast wherever you get your podcasts, except Spotify for now. But that includes YouTube. Social media-wise, we're most active on Twitter and also Blue Sky. Our handle for both is at Davos Fingers. And didn't you guys just have a special episode that you uploaded to YouTube? We did. For those that are familiar with the Game of Thrones slash A Song of Ice and Fire world, there's a character named Stannis Baratheon who people like enjoy making fun of. And we did a roast of Stannis Baratheon where we brought on some of our friends from the fandom and they all compare or compiled little roast material and we roasted him for about 45 minutes the other day. It was a lot of fun. Tremendous. I, I You can find it on YouTube. I have clicked on it. I haven't watched much. I think I've watched only the first like five or six minutes and then I had something else to do. But okay. I do intend on watching the entire video. It sounds just from the things I've seen on social media since the episode, it sounds like you guys had a blast. It's pretty savage. You'll <laughs> you'll feel very uncomfortable as you're laughing your butt off. I'm assuming so. this is an NSFW <laughs> video? That would be a safe assumption, yes. <laughs> In fact, I would insist upon it. <laughs> awesome. Well, coming up on the next episode... K2 will join me for book number 14 in the New Jedi Order series, Destiny's Way by Walter John Williams. You can look forward to that episode coming out on Friday, October 13th, the scariest Friday of the year. Thank you very much for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. I'm Aaron Motes. May the Force be with you. And remember, there's always a bit of truth in Legends.